And so let's start by writing down this statement and we say it a lot, but it's important that we, we don't just know it, but we live it. The most important person you lead is yourself because the only person that you can control is you. So the most important person you lead is yourself. You know, the most important relationship you have obviously is with the father, but then after that, it's your relationship with you. And that requires that we get alone, as the Bible says, be still and know that He is God. It requires that that becomes the foundation of the life that we live on the outside, is this place of stillness, first and foremost before the Father. But then after that, as we take what He's given us and we work it into our own lives in, in the way that it would change us. The, the Bible says that we should be changed um, from glory to glory, from faith to faith and and that happens in his presence so if we've been a believer for years and years and years there should be evidence in our lives there should be progress it's not just that we spent time with him but it's obvious that we've spent time with him because there's a progression moving in and through us and so we've been looking at Paul's um, example as leaders in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. And so we're asking ourselves, am I followable? And to the degree that I am, I want to go farther. I'm not satisfied with where I am. You know, to be followable requires that we be consistent. Could you write down this definition of consistent? Consistent means showing steady conformity. Showing steady conformity showing steady conformity to character, profession, belief, or custom. And you might start that word profession. We're going to come back to that. Maybe not this week, but at some point. Showing steady conformity to character, profession, belief, or custom. It's, it's, and I like this definition. It's marked by harmony. Well, what would it be in harmony to? It would be in harmony with who and how God has made us to be. So we're to be, in order to be followable, you have to be consistent. You have to be consistent, which is showing steady conformity to character, profession, belief, or custom. Let's look at three verses. Um, so we have biblical context for those, um, those definitions. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, this is one of my favorite verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, we're going to be looking at it in the living King James, obviously, and then the living, the message, and the passion. If you want to write that in your notes, we're going to look at it in all four of those places. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Paul said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work. And if you have a Bible, you might underline or circle in the work of the Lord. I know in Bible school, Pastor Hagen would always say, how do you spell, how do you spell ministry? W-O-R-K. You know, it's important that we recognize that, that there's, there's a work to be done. There's assignments. Those of you that are ministry trainers and leads, you're so aware of this because preparations are main, um, uh, opportunities are prepared for the people to sign up for this and sign up for that. And if we don't do our part, if we don't work the work, if we're not in our place, then what happens? We don't get the desired results. And so Paul is saying, you know, it's not that just that we, have you ever been around those kind of people that they're just happy to be? You know what I mean? They're just happy to be and they're happy, they're even happier to be with you. And they may fail to acknowledge that there's actually something that we need to do. We, do, we can't just be, you know. And it's great to just be uh, when you're on vacation or holiday. But after that, there's, there's probably work to be done. And so Paul said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. The Living Bible says, so my dear brothers, since future victory is sure. 
Be strong and steady, always abounding in the Lord's work, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever wasted as it would be if there were no resurrection. The Passion says, Now, beloved ones, stand firm and secure. Live your lives, I like this, with an unshakable confidence. We know that we prosper and excel in every season by serving the Lord, because we are assured that our union with the Lord makes our labor productive with fruit that endures. Hallelujah. The message says, with all this going for us, my dear friends, stand your ground. Don't hold back. Throw yourselves into the work of the master, confident that nothing you do for him is ever a waste of time or effort. So as leaders, we're to be consistent. We're to be not moved by what's going on around us. And then um, Romans chapter eight, verse 29, we quote this verse a lot. For whom he did foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed. So who am I gonna be conformed to? You know, in many places, people, even believers, um, um, pride themselves or derive security in their consistency as it pertains to things that are without what I mean on the outside of their relationship with God. They don't, they don't ever miss work. They show up on time, they excel and they're faithful. But as it pertains to the consistency with which they devote themselves to their relationship with God, they are not consistent, right? And so we're talking about what, what is first and foremost our destiny as men and women, all men and women were born with the desired end result to look like Jesus. That's not just for people in the ministry. That's for everybody born. Jesus was the firstborn. And, and so in that, we're to follow his example and perfectly please the Father with our lives. And if he can do it, we can do it. We can do it. So this is the goal. The goal would not be that as believers, yet so many believers fall into this deceptive trap. The goal would not be that we would gain the whole world and lose out on the one thing that would be eternal. And that's our plan and purpose as it pertains to his desires for our life. So we're to be conformed. The consistency with which we should be moving and maturing into is not as it pertains to without, number one, but within. If we would make the focus of our lives to be consistent with him, then all this other stuff will sort itself out. And it will be a byproduct, an authentic byproduct of our relationship with him instead of a put on. Because you know that that's what it is, that anything that you do in and of yourself, I don't care if you've been faithful at that job for years and years and years outside of a devotion first and foremost to him, you're gonna get tired of it. You're gonna get tired of doing it. There's gonna be a lack of satisfaction. There's gonna be a lack of joy. And what happens when you're not good, then everything you touch is vulnerable. Now all of a sudden you're not happy in your marriage. Now all of a sudden your kids get on your last nerve. You know, they were on your nerves, but now there's no nerves left. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's like the grace has lifted. That's what happens when we endeavor to do things in and of ourselves. That's, that's what happens when we don't do things in the right order, recognizing that we are a spirit, we have a soul and we live in a body. So spirit comes first. Say that after me, spirit comes first. So we're to be conformed to his image. Now, the great thing about this in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, and I, this brings such comfort to me because the reality is this is not a destination. You know, we've got some seniors in high school right now and they're like, they cannot wait. It's almost over for them. Okay, they've got like one week left. And this is a big milestone. This is a destination. If we don't watch ourselves, we become programmed in that way as it pertains to our relationship with God, where we think we're gonna get to a certain place and then we're gonna be good and we're gonna have it all together. Well, the reality is if we, if we wanna focus on the highest level of truth, in Him, we're already in that place. Okay, we're already operating from a place of perfection in him. I mean, are you already healed today? Can I get a good, amen, I'm already healed. Are you already rich today in him? Yes, I'm already rich. Are you already at full peace today in him? Yes. So we're already operating from a place of perfection, but yet we're working that out. And, and we see here this revelation from John in verses one through three, that ultimately that this is a process it's not gonna fully manifest itself until we see him. 
That's what verse two says. Beloved, now are we, we, are we the sons of God? And it doesn't appear yet what we will be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him. Gosh, that should bring such comfort to you today. See, the enemy is such an accuser and he wants you to focus on all that you've not manifested yet, all that maybe you aren't, instead of taking a, a comfort in the fact that I'm in process, I'm moving into this and until I see him, I'm still gonna need to, to, to operate in a greater level of, of yieldedness to everything that he's done. So, so it's not over yet. You know, you heard that a lot. It's not over till the fat lady sings. I don't even know where that came from. And, and it was wrong to judge her. You know what I mean? Whoever she is, it's not over until he returns. It's not over. I don't care how, how long you may in and of yourself feel as though you've been walking around the same mountain, that representing an attitude or, or a frustration within yourself that you just maybe haven't developed into full maturity. That's okay. It's not over till it's over. When is that over? When I see him. And so we continue to, to operate from this knowledge. Now, the reality is, and you ask yourself, do you want to grow? You know, when you think about Moses and his leadership and, and the way that God continually spoke to him and, and taught him and helped him, you know, obviously he spoke to him initially um, when he was on the backside of the wilderness, he saw a burning bush and, and God told him, you're gonna be the deliverer. He gave him a rod. He proved himself to him. He gave him an assistant. He gave him Aaron um, um, because Moses was, wasn't confident in his speaking. Um, and then um, he, at, at a later point, he, he um, gives him the t- Ten Commandments, and and he sees the glory of God. Then his father-in-law speaks to him and says, "Moses, you're going to need some help. You can't do all this." So, so we can see a progression in Moses' leadership capacity. But he had to cooperate with that. See, we become so satisfied with what we have and any moment we allow ourselves to become satisfied or content at that moment, um, and, and not content in the sense that, that, that we're not grateful, but, but I mean like uh, this, as Pastor Dean would say, like we get comfortable, we, we kind of chill, we kind of chill out. You're vulnerable in those moments. It doesn't matter how far you've come, what do we all know? There's more. And so we have to ask ourselves, do I really desire to grow or am I, because I, I think in my opinion, you, you can discern for yourself, but don't you think that Aaron and Miriam kind of got satisfied? They kind of got complacent. They kind of got casual with their places on, on the team because Aaron stops listening to Moses, which is stopping listening to the father and starts in turn listening to the people. And then Miriam starts getting an attitude and becoming judgmental with her leader, right? So, so I think that if we're going to continue to move forward, then as a team, as leaders, we have to move forward. We can't just be content that there's progress happening around us. We've got to determine that we want to be a part of that process and we want to be a part of that progress. And so, so there's five things that I want to show you today and we're still looking at our attitude, but these things came up in my heart um, as a preliminary to those thoughts and we'll get back into them. People who desire to grow and, and this, this takes what is a desire and turns it into action. Um, otherwise, you know, good intentions won't get it for you. Okay. Just, well, you should. And I think sometimes the deception can be, well, I'm here and I've been loyal. Okay. Well, Aaron and Miriam were there too, but it was only a matter of time before they were not loyal because they weren't in and of themselves growing. You can't become satisfied with the fact that people around you are growing and your leaders are growing. You're a leader in your perspective place of influence and it's required of you to also grow. And so leaders or people who desire to grow, number one, are learners. They're learners, they're studiers, they're readers. Don't you know that there's a, a, a fight more than ever before for, for men to be lovers of themselves, uh, uh, obviously, but lovers of pleasures, right? That you would rather sit down and be entertained than read and grow and study, right? More than ever, maybe there's that pressure. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 15 says that we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed. 
in your studying, I encourage you first and foremost to, to take advantage of the tools that your pastor has given you. And there's so many, but then outside of that, ask the spirit of God to direct you. Don't study what somebody else is studying unless they're your contact, they're your voice, they're your leader. I know there was a period of time in my life where I was reading probably, uh, you know, three or four books a month. And I was, I was reading constantly, but I was doing it in and of myself. And, and, and so, I mean, you could, gosh, that's a lot of voices. I mean, that's a lot to assimilate. Um, and so, so I just determined this is not, this is me. This is not you. Father, I want you to direct me in what I should read, what I should listen to. And of course, all of that starts with your supply, your voice. What is your pastor reading? What have they set before you? What tools have they given you? Because that's your primary supply. But then stewarding those things and determining that that's an important part of my day. That's not a mandatory part of my day. And you gotta kind of jack yourselves up into that. Because in many cases, we look at that time that we would spend reading or that time we would spend focused on listening to a message, and it doesn't carry the same enthusiasm in our hearts and our lives as sitting down and watching a television show or playing with our dog or whatever, whatever your leisure is. You understand? If you want to grow, you have to intentionally decide, I'm going to learn something today. I'm not just going to read it, but I'm going to meditate on it. I'm going to make it a part of me. Number two, um, people who desire to grow aren't prideful when they're disciplined. People who desire to grow are not prideful when they're disciplined or they're not defensive. In Hebrews chapter 12, this is such a great chapter. One of the greats, one of my favorites. I wanna read to you from the Passion Bible, just two verses, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10 and 11. Our parents corrected us for the short time of our childhood as it seemed good to them, but God corrects us throughout our lives, which means we never get to a point where we have arrived. Now, again, we know in Him we have arrived, but the manifestation of that is progressive. And there's always more, that as long as you live, there'll be more. You know, God spoke to Brother Copeland several years ago and said, I have ministry gifts that, that, don't, that don't even begin to unfold themselves until the 80 year mark. And then I have other gifts that don't even begin to unfold, unfold themselves until the 90 year mark and the 100 year mark, all the way to 120. And he said, I, I would desire that men and women would desire for those gifts and that would receive those and cooperate with those and walk into those. So throughout our lives, our Father God corrects us for our own good, giving us an invitation to share His holiness. Listen, just because you have it doesn't mean you're benefiting from it. Just because you have it, just because you have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead doesn't mean you're benefiting from it. Just because you've been given power over all the power of the enemy doesn't mean that he's not beating you up. You've got to participate in the victory that you've been given. And that requires correction. That requires a release of things that are, are at this point dead weight. Maybe a year ago, they weren't dead weight. You didn't see them that way. But the moment the conviction comes and you begin to watch that television show that you've always watched and there's a little stirring on the inside that, that would, would cause you to maybe turn that thing off. Or maybe you always listen to this, but now when you do, there's just this in, inward kind of just, and you just, I don't wanna listen to that, you know? And so, so it goes on to say in verse 11, now all discipline, it seems to be more pain than pleasure, yet later it will produce what? A transformation of character. You cannot move forward without correction. You cannot move forward without discipline. And even if it comes to you in the, in, the, in the environment of a church setting, in which case is a great way because it's not necessarily one-on-one. -on -one. Do you know that so many people find it easier to even excuse themselves from that kind of discipline for whatever reason, they begin to make excuses or, or they begin to take offense with whoever would be speaking in such a way that they would, what happens? You stay in the same place. If you wanna grow, number three, growers, those who desire to grow, they're not discouraged when they miss it. They're not discouraged when they miss it. And, and I just want you to know that every time you embrace that, 
let's, let's use this example. When you fall, you know, from, from maybe this chair, it's not very high. Um, you know, it's not really gonna hurt that bad. Whereas if you fell from, you know, a 13 story building, that's gonna create some problems, right? So in essence, if you won't put yourself on a pedestal, then when you make a mistake, it won't be so devastating. See, people put themselves on a pedestal in their, uh, for why? Performance, maybe because of your intellect, maybe because of your education, maybe because of how much money you have, maybe because of how you get everything together, your appearances, everything's organized, you look sharp, your spouse is sharp, your kids are sharp, right? There's all of these reasons why we, we, we glorify our own lives, you understand? We find security in what we've got going on, right? Well, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, and, and so this is what we have to know that a baby learning to walk, you know, a, a, a teenager learning to drive, you know, in all these different seasons, there's, there's some hangups, you know, there's some challenges. In Proverbs 24, verse 16, it says, for the just man falls seven times and rises up again. Falling is inevitable in the sense that as you grow and you're working things out, you could potentially miss it and make a mistake. The goal would be though to not in pride exalt yourself to such a place that every time you make a mistake, see the person that cannot handle making a mistake actually thought they were above them. They actually, it's so, uh, you know, God's not given us a spirit of fear, an attitude of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. But somebody who has to apologize multiple times, you know what I mean? Like I already forgave you the first time you apologized. Why are you apologizing again? What do I know immediately? I just was met with pride. Did you think that I thought you weren't gonna fail? Did you think that I thought that you were above that? Because here's the thing, let's all get on the same page here. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And when you miss it, the goal would be to wholeheartedly embrace the hand with which was extended, whether it's a loving Christian hand or it's your boss saying, you better get your act together and just get up. Get up in His grace. Get up in His anointing. But if you honestly think you're never gonna fall, that prideful place will cause you to really almost overturn all that you've got. It'll create a fall, not just in this one area, but all over the place. It'll start to fall apart. So, so people who desire to grow aren't discouraged. They don't lack courage when they miss it. They just acknowledge that that area needs more growth. It needs attention. And so I'm gonna put forth the effort. But if I'm excessively apologizing, if I'm days later, if I'm hours later, if I'm moments later, I'm not over it. Why'd you get on top of a 13 story building anyway? Because in essence, you're having a hard time falling right now. And this shouldn't be a problem. You actually woke up today and thought you were gonna nail it. Why would you do that? I love you, but why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just wake up today and say, God in you, I can do all things. So I, by your grace, I wanna hear your voice. I wanna follow you. I want, I want all that I say and all that I do to be you. And so help me, show me if I'm missing it. I know there's people watching my blind side, my, my leaders, my pastors, my bosses. And so Father, I give myself to them, you know, and, and I believe that progress is inevitable, but perfection only is found in Him. And the reality is we're all maturing as we take our place in Him. People who desire to grow. See, these are things that'll get you out of the race. They'll, you, they'll get you disconnected from your place and the people who are anointed and called to help you in your race, to lead you in your race. All this pride, all this, all this um, you know, perfectionism, all this, it's just a bunch of nonsense. Number four, um, they're, people who desire to grow aren't excuse makers. Now, listen, let me, let me tell you something. Just because you're not an excuse maker doesn't mean that you didn't have an excuse. What I mean by that is there's always a why behind every what. And if your employer asks you, your boss, your leader, if they ask you for the why behind the what, then at which point you can give that to them. Okay, because in many cases, it's not just that you missed it, but it's how you missed it. 
that, that plays into how you can move past that into the future. And so sometimes those things are relevant, but, but really what happens is as people make excuses, they excuse themselves from the responsibility needed to have, a, have avoided that situation in the first place. Right? So the, the, the parable of the talents, Proverbs 25, verse um, 24, 25, 24, the wicked servant, he said, I knew you to be a hard man. So we know obviously that he wasn't really paying attention. And so he didn't do anything with what he had been given. And his excuse was, you are hard. You are hard. Now, obviously that's very telling about his character and how he had related to and paid attention to the father, but ultimately, or, or to the master, but we know it to be the father, but ultimately did that, did that cause, oh, okay, you just mis, you misunderstood me and who I was and how I was. I apologize. Let me, let, me, let me specialize that communication in such a way that you get it and you understand that that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Jesus, do you understand that Jesus never took people's excuses? He never did. Now, maybe you had a parent that did. Maybe you had a boss that you can manipulate in that way, right? Maybe you've had a spouse that you've been able to, to worm your way out of, a, you know, why you didn't do what you'd said you were gonna do, right? Jesus will love you. Just like he looked at the rich young ruler, the Bible says, and he loved him, but he didn't chase after him. Okay, just like we know, he loved those who said, listen, I wanna follow you, but I got some business at home I wanna take care of. Okay, we know we, he looked at them and loved them, but he didn't say, you're right, take care of that. He doesn't, Jesus doesn't, doesn't do anything with your excuses. And so people who desire to grow, in many cases, the farther you go with him, you acknowledge they're just not relevant. You're just not relevant. All the reasons why, you know, the way that I was raised, I've got this going on in my body, I'm facing this, I'm facing that, not relevant. Not relevant in light of what he's already done. Number five, people who desire to go, and we didn't get into attitude today, but we will next week. They are not content with the status quo. People who are growers are not content with the status quo. In Mark chapter seven, verse 37, it was said of Jesus, they were utterly astonished saying, he has done all things. Everyone say all things. Well, he makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. So in, in one translation, it says he does everything excellently. And this is our goal, Mark 7, 37, that we would not be content with the status quo, that we would not, if you're gonna grow, you're gonna have to push past the limitations of what you see. You're gonna have to push back what's always been done. You're gonna have to push back what you feel works because here's the reality, just because it worked today or it worked last year, doesn't mean it's gonna work next year. That's why you have to consistently and constantly desire to grow. See, in order, it's been said, to get an individual behind you to take one step. You want somebody behind you, somebody that you're leading. And again, we're not responsible for who's following us, but we're responsible to position ourselves in such a way that people can, especially as it pertains to those in our own household, our children. But you're to be six steps ahead of them in order for them to move one. So if you're not a grower, then what's happening to everybody behind you? They're not growing. And we are called to growth. We are called to this sort, this sort of, of consistency, this sort of steadiness that keeps pressing through, that keeps persevering in what? In financial maturity and in, in status and in fame by the world's definition? No, of course not. In the work of the Lord. Father God, thank you for helping us um, to continue to position our, our want to's in such a way that we would not only just have a desire to grow and see increase in our lives, but we would do those things that were necessary in order to appropriate and make position and make way for that growth. And we thank you for it in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys.